Now, George Galloway has just begun work once more as a member of parliament. I think it's either the seventh time or the eighth time. He brings 50 years of experience and he's already said that he wants to oust Labour's deputy leader from parliament. He was sworn in as an MP following his by-election win in Rochdale last week. George joins me now. Lovely to see you, sir. And you, you could call me MP again after a brief <laughs> interlude of nine years. <laughs> you just keep coming back and back, Mr Galloway. Mr. Frank Sinatra. Fair, fair to say uh, you've put the wind up Westminster by your return. Yes, uh, and it's uh, a, a joy to behold not just Westminster, but their, their coterie, their echo chamber in the legacy media. Uh, ha have temporarily, one hopes, lost their minds. Uh, the Prime Minister erected uh, a, a lectern and a presumably big platform outside 10 Downing Street at the state's expense for an entirely party political uh, broadcast uh, to which there was no reply, not even at Prime Minister's questions where I failed to catch the speaker's eye. And I, I no longer opened the Google alerts of right-wing commentators, many of them on your very channel, uh, literally spewing hate speech at me, over me, about me. Uh, I'm not sure what I did to deserve it, but hey, it's a question of dogs barking and the caravan moving on. How do you feel about that reaction? You know, I said at the top that, you know, you're, uh, you're long in the tooth when it comes to being in Westminster, being in that febrile uh, environment. Uh, but after all of this time, with all of your experience, to be confronted with that kind of reaction, a prime minister saying that it was beyond alarming as a, a threat to democracy that, that a, a, a legitimate candidate had won a by-election. How, what was your gut reaction to that? Well, you know, I've often uh, been Daniel in the lion's den, dare to be a Daniel, uh, dare to stand alone. Uh, used to be one of my hero, Mr. Ben's favorite rhymes. Uh, and so I don't mind it. I'm only perplexed when it comes from unexpected quarters, uh, as in GB News uh, uh, terms, it has. But the expected usual suspects I, I relish their uh, angst. Um, I'm an experienced short sword fighter, as you said, for more than 50 years in politics. So, you know, I'm well able to handle it. The facts are chills that win a ding, as our bard said. Facts can't be changed. Uh, not only did I win a crushing victory over all three big parties of the state, but they didn't even come in second, uh, a point which they all tried to um, erase. Uh, between me and a totally unknown independent, unknown outside Rochdale, uh, we got almost two thirds of the votes, leaving the big three, big four parties of the state to share the other third. Uh, this is a crushing rejection of uh, the uni party the two cheeks of the same backside, who all got a big spanking uh, on uh, Thursday night past. What does it tell us about where we are now with politics in Britain, with democracy in Britain? As you say, the big two, the Conservatives and Labour, you know, beaten back by yourself and a previously a hitherto unknown independent. What is the nature of the powerless state of politics in this country? Well, uh, nobody loves them. Uh, that much could not be denied even by their mothers. Nobody loves Labour or the Conservatives, Sunak or Starmer, uh, quite possibly not even their mothers. And that's the first thing you have to chalk up as an uncontested fact. People still move for them, but only out of interest, not out of love. And when the public have a chance to vote for someone who can credibly defeat them, then they take that opportunity. 
And I think that uh, this was the straw that broke the camel's back in Rochdale. Uh, the, uh, the spread of candidates, challengers, new parties, independent candidates, and so on, is now proceeding like wildfire. If I tell you that I have now in my pocket more than 300 prospective parliamentary candidates, all paying their own election expenses, by the way, because we can't pay them, more than 300 Workers' Party parliamentary candidates. Imagine that. Uh, we, we, we didn't have three four weeks ago. Now we've got more than 300. And then when you add in the independents that are popping up, growing like topsy across the country, uh, we are talking about a challenge to the legacy parties in practically every constituency in the land, certainly many hundreds of them. And thus the uh, course of the next general election is radically altered. Uh, we'll either win seats or we'll stop Keir Starmer from winning them. Thus, the outcome of the general election is dramatically uh, uh, altered and all bets are off. So when I saw, for example, your own uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg of your parish making a tear-stained plea on GB News for people not to abandon the Labour Party, how much the country needs the Labour Party. I scratch my head in utter bewilderment, I must tell you. Bear with me, George. Tom Buick, do you scratch your head in bewilderment? What do you make of the, of the changes that are, in, that are indicated, that are evidenced by Mr Galloway's success in Rochdale and, as he says, the, the, the possibility now of an alternative to the, to the two cheeks of the same backside? Like a lot of ordinary voters, I'm scratching my head at just the degree of polarisation now that exists in our society. And yes, you know, Labour and the Conservative Party need to take some responsibility for that kind of climate. But at the end of the day, we've also seen now elected to our mother of all parliaments, politicians who, you know, depending on your point of view, I mean, George Galloway won the election, congratulations. Um, but to some people, he's a demagogue. And the definition of a demagogue is someone who appeals to prejudice rather than rational arguments. So my retort back to George Galloway is, in terms of his politics going forward, is he going to be a unifier or is he going to continue to be a divisive force in British politics? George, do you see yourself? What do you, or what is your reaction to, to being uh, uh, marked as a divisive figure in British politics? Well, I don't know who your guest is. I've never heard of him before and I shan't stoop to answer his smear. I was elected in a democratic election with a thumping majority in which the two big parties of the state came third and fifth. So I don't have to answer to any unknown guest of yours. And I've got news for him. Politics was divisive from the moment that democracy existed. You decide to support this war or oppose this war. That's a division. Somebody has to speak for both sides of that division. I was kicked out of the Labour Party for being a leader of the, war, the movement against the war on Iraq. Uh, no doubt your guest and others would have said my opposition to the Iraq war was divisive. But I turned out to be right. The people pushing for the war turned out to be wrong now even by their own admission. And unfortunately, a million people lie dead and extremism cascading around the world as a result of my failure to persuade enough people to oppose that war. You said that what happened in Rochdale, your attention on Rochdale was for Gaza. Can you tell me what you mean and meant by that? Well, the people who oppose the uh, murderous war in Gaza, which has reached the stage that the highest court in the world has said that it can plausibly be described as a genocide, pretty strong and heavy charge, which the highest court in the world has sent Israel for trial on, 
uh, is uh, so horrific to so many millions of people in this country and indeed around the world uh, that it is a wonder that they are locked out of media and parliamentary opinion. Uh, no one speaks for the people out on the streets from Land's End to John O'Groats every other Saturday and midweeks and rain, hail, snow. Uh, nobody speaks for them in Parliament. They don't get a look in uh, in the, uh, the legacy media on the television. If they are interviewed, as you're interviewing me now, they're called uh, divisive or demagogic because they want to stop children being killed, slaughtered every day and night of the last 150 days. So there's something of a conspiracy against the voices for peace, for ceasefire, for withdrawal uh, from this war. And then a by-election came along. Uh, and what better place to fight, to break the silence, to break the mold, uh, than a parliamentary by-election, where in the greater Manchester region alone, of which Rochdale is a part, there are the best part of a million and a half or two million people who oppose this war, based on my extrapolation from national opinion polling, attendance at protests and so on. So it became a greater Manchester cause celebra, and people flooded in from all over the region. They worked uh, day and night, vast majority of them white English people, by the way, uh, who knocked on every door in the constituency, and the rest is history. We beat the uh, legacy political parties out the park. George, George, but for Gaza, but for events in Gaza, would you even have contemplated a return to Westminster? I probably would have in Rochdale. I knew the deceased Member of Parliament very well for 40 years. I knew the town of Rochdale very well, as I've been speaking in it regularly for 25 years. My daughter was born nearby. Two of my sons live nearby. And for my sins, I attend Old Trafford in Manchester every other week. So uh, I'm deeply uh, immersed in this part of the world. So I probably would. I, I probably wouldn't have if the by-election had been in, I don't know, the home counties somewhere. But in Rochdale, in the Northwest, in Greater Manchester, where I already knew I had a lot of support, yes, I probably would. George, Tom, someone does have to speak up for Gaza and the Gazans. You know, you say you use the word demagogue, uh, you use the word divisive, but surely it is true to say that with 30,000 dead, 100,000 people in total dead or wounded or lost in the rubble, someone is right to speak up for Gaza. And I accept George Galloway can speak up for whoever he likes. He's now an elected member of parliament. But with that comes a lot of responsibility. It comes, for example, not just for the constituents of Rochdale, but in terms of taking part in our national debate, that we don't further tensions, sectarianism, or indeed promote the idea that we should be even electing factions based on religious grounds to parliament. How about that, George? Uh, you, you and I, we, I think we would both concede that the Britain that you and I grew up in has, has radically changed in a very brief space of time. I think it's been more changed and changed more quickly than perhaps any other country possibly ever. Uh, do, you, do you understand, sympathise with the anxieties, the angers, the despair that's there in many communities around the country in the face of change? Uh, that much is uh, undoubtedly true, but I really must deal with this divisive issue. You, you can't sit on the fence on the plausible genocide in Gaza. You're either for it or you're against it. If you're against it, you must speak against it. You must march against it. You must protest about it. And you must call out the people proselytizing for it. Now, if that is divisive, well, what else can one do? Can we try and find a cozy consensus? Maybe we'll kill just people over the age of 45. 
maybe will only starve uh, those uh, who are already uh, overweight. I mean, what's the consensus, the non-divisive approach to this? Children are being killed. I'm against it. I spoke out against it. The people endorsed my stance. And that's really all there is to it. I have no responsibility to your guest to keep my criticism of a genocide within bounds that please him, even if I were able to divine what those bounds might be. But yes, there's look, there's always been division in politics, Neil. I was active in my first general election at the age of 10 in 1964, when Mr. Wilson savaged uh, the 13th Earl of Hume, who was the Conservative Prime Minister at the time, and uh, broke uh, the apparently never-ending rule of the upper-class Conservative patricians. It was a divisive time. The 60s were divisive. The 70s, even more divisive. And they didn't require me in Parliament to be divisive. I've done a, an oral book on the 1970s. Uh, the 70s was the most extraordinary decade in modern times that our country has ever gone through. So look, politics is divisive. Do you go this way or do you go that way? And let the uh, schools of thought contend and let the people choose between them. That's my view. George Galloway, MP, we will all look forward with a great deal of fascination to see how your latest tenure in Westminster will play out. Thank you so much for your time this evening.